<laughs> I, I want you to look at something. I want you to look at something, okay? See these giant circles under my eyes? See my you know, scraggly beard? I haven't, I haven't shaved lately. I looked fine yesterday. But today, today I watched Unimatrix Zero. Now look at me. Oh god, look at me. Okay, I'm exaggerating. There are worse episodes of Trek. There's even worse episodes of Voyager. But Unimatrix Zero's a mess. It is just a mess. There's like no other way to call it. I have a full page and a half of notes about episode one. For those curious, um, for those who haven't heard me say this before, Whenever I come to a two-parter, I never decide in advance if I'm going to discuss both episodes separately, with one exception. There's actually an episode coming up, probably in like four years, uh, that I already know in advance I'm going to do two episodes on. That would be Best of Both Worlds, because the two episodes deserve to be talked about completely separately. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Normally, <laughs> with that one exception, when I approach a two-parter, I have no idea if I'm going to do one episode or two episodes on it. You know, treat it as one episode or two episodes, basically, is what that boils down to. And it usually has to do with uh, the construction of the episodes themselves and how much they cohese together and how much I have to say. You know, if I have a lot to say, even about one part, then I'll probably split it up, which is why we're only doing Unimatrix Part 1 today. Now, I'm not 100% sure why this episode is such a mess. I've heard two theories, well, no, that's not true, actually. I have heard one theory, and I have another theory that I've come up with. Because I, I, I didn't believe the theory. I didn't believe what everyone else said. I looked at it and was like, that doesn't quite track for me. And I started looking into some of the behind-the-scenes stuff, and I have my own theory, which I'll be sharing with you. But it is worthy of note, these are both still theories. We don't actually know why this episode is such a mess. Oh my god, I just noticed something. So, here, look at my notes, look at my notes. I don't know if you can quite tell, but there's a little section up here I cordoned off that I was going to put anything positive about the episode I saw, okay? Now, I don't know if you can quite tell, but there is a single note up there. One thing. <laughs> just, wow. Um, the original story for Unimatrix Zero was put out by uh, Sussman. It had to do with... Annika Hansen's father. I can't even remember his name, but, you know, Mr. Hansen. And he was going to have, thanks to the machinations of the Queen and some other things, he was going to have quietly led a resistance inside the collective mind in a way that the collective wouldn't recognize, and then he would then reach out, having, having gained support over the last, I guess, year and a half or so of episodes, he would have reached out to Seven, saying, you know, I need your support externally in order to help me when I'm going internally, and he was going to lead a revolt against the Borg. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily a good storyline, or would have been better, but that was the original story pitch by Mike, uh, Mike I think it is, Mike Sussman. Now, here's the facts we do know. We know that a producer insisted that that be changed and that we know that change was done at the last minute like they had, they already had almost all of the script ready for the original Sussman you know revolution plot and they were basically ready to go and start filming and 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 you know putting lines to paper and whatnot and the actors were about ready to receive their copies and then the producer a producer we don't know which came down and said no nope, change it and we know that the change that was insisted upon was to make it a romance story for seven rather than her reuniting with her father these are the free three facts we know the most common theory i hear about why this episode is a mess is because it is written by the actual screenplay, the actual teleplay was done by Brennan Braga and Joe Minoski. And the theory is that they're both garbage writers who are terrible and just put out another crap Voyager episode. Now, I really hope you've been paying attention throughout my Rumination series. I, I, I really do. I mean, the major point, the primary point of the Ruminations is to encourage thought. To encourage people to think and understand and to, you know, to have more than just a black and white, good or bad. There's, there's layers. Even a bad episode can have good moments. Even a good episode can have bad moments. And there's always the why behind it that I've tried to go into. And I think I have put forth a lot of evidence over the last years that Brennan Braga and Joe Minoski are not bad writers. They have their flaws. Brandon Braga is really have, has problems with things like continuity and cohesive... Uh, well, not cohesive, that's the wrong word, but 
He's really good at high concept stuff, and he's really bad at basically everything else. Um, but he, he's really good at concepts and mind games, and he likes to really pull a large amount of scale out of a work. Joe Minoski is very good at characters. He's good at down-to-earth, personal, in-your-face, character development, characterization stuff. He's also very bad at continuity as well. The two of them have worked before and produced some very good episodes, including what is usually considered the best episode of Voyager. And, of course, they, put, they both put out uh, Concerning Flight, which I talked about back then. And, and there's other examples. I've, I've given my evidence for this as my point. So I don't believe that theory. It is still possible, I will allow. It is possible they just had a bad day. I mean, uh, Brennan Braga and uh, uh, Ronald D. Moore both wrote Generations, which was gutter trash. And yet, they also both wrote All Good Things, which was brilliant. In fact, they wrote both at the same time. So it is possible they literally just had an off day. We've seen that happen in Star Trek, with Braga, actually. So that is possible, but I don't think that's what this is. And having rewatched this episode just now, just prior to sitting down recording, and having really analyzed it, I am almost convinced that is not the problem. Because I think this is Rick Berman's fault. Oh, hang on, hang on. I actually forgot. Sorry, sorry. I actually have Rick Berman here with me. Uh, Rick Berman, would you like to give any thoughts on this episode? Well, I was just thinking that rather than having a good episode, we could have a garbage episode that had more sex and romance in it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> in all seriousness, I think this is Rick Berman's fault. I think he was the producer. I think he's the one who came down and said, no, change it. We know the changes were last minute, and it shows. I have a note here that I'm going to skip ahead and talk about. If you really watch this episode, really analyze it like I just did. I don't recommend that. It's a garbage episode. But if you really do dig into it, it feels like something that's a first draft. Because that's one of the big reasons why I say this isn't like as bad of an episode as other Trek. There's worse Trek. There's Trek that is well con that is something that has obviously been constructed and then was terrible. This feels like it's made out of Lego. I'm sorry, I mean no offense to Lego. This feels like it was made out of Play-Doh, to use a relative equivalent, when you're trying to build a ship. You know? <laughs> a ship made out of metal or Play-Doh. I mean, which one do you think is going to work better? Dr. Seuss notwithstanding. And, and it, this is clearly shows every, every, every single scene. I stopped writing down the specific points. I was initially, and then I was like, no, I, I gotta stop, because every single scene has construction problems, has written problems, it has things going through it that it's like, this doesn't make sense, or this doesn't flow properly. It, it's a first draft. Seriously, watch the episode, listen to the dialogue, r feel how the scenes pace together, feel how the lines mesh with the other lines, or rather don't mesh with the other lines, preceding and before, and everything feels like this was something that someone wrote out in a hurry and then didn't have time to proof it, didn't have time to do the, the rewrite, didn't have time to polish it. It was just, uh, first draft, go! Now, I'm sorry, but even the best authors in the world don't do first draft takes. Or if they do, they're usually pretty obvious that they are. You do your first draft, and then you go back and reread it, and you're like, well... And then you go back and you reread it, and then you go back and... Now, granted, that's uh, I, I actually probably do that more than most people because I hate my own writing. You know, usually doing like five or six retakes is my own work before I feel like it's actually where I feel you know where I think it's good. But and and there's a reason script doctors is a is a modern everyday profession in Hollywood for that matter. But point being, this that's what I think happened. I think Rick Berman came down and said, you know, do this terrible thing. I think he was the producer, and I think they had to change the script at the last minute. And that's why I think this is a crap episode. I also want to mention something, because the director is not exactly a bad director. His name's Alan Croker, right? And yet the directing in this episode is not good. And furthermore, the music, I know this is a weird complaint, is not good. Now, I'm going to stop speaking in generals. I wrote down notes in order of the episode, so we're going to start kind of going through the episode. Warning. I'm usually pretty positive on this show. In fact, that's one of the things I'm rather pleased with that, that I've managed to continue all these years despite going through Voyager of all things. And 
it's just generally one of my tenets of the show, positivity and truth. Well, in this case, truth outweighs positivity. So this, this is your warning. I'm going to be a lot more nitpicky than I usually am. And, again, normally I would let little nitpicks slide. I'm not usually the kind of guy who, like in our previous episode, you know, where um, Icheb was pointing out all the little technical problems with Neelix's story. I'm not usually the kind of guy who points out those things out. I'll notice them and I'll go, heh, <laughs> and then that's it. But this whole episode is such a jumble of unnecessariness. Yes, I just made up that word. That every single point of it that was wrong bothered me. So I'm going to point, point out all of them. So let's go down the list here, shall we? I have a question for you. I have the word why a lot in these notes. Why does the queen explain her plan out loud? Let me actually rewind that. Why is this queen talking out loud at all? Why is the queen explaining something, anything, at all, to a drone? Why is that a thing? Why is she explaining her evil plot to a drone? Why is she tr explaining her evil plot to a drone? Out loud. Why is it that the drone, who I remind you, thanks to the events of this episode, has no memory of anything other than being a drone is someone that she can't just immediately know everything he knows. Why is it that she considers disconnecting him a punishment, and it is a punishment, and yet she does that on the presumption that... I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. Also, Mr. Drone Guy masters the word I in seconds. Remember how long it took you to master the word I? Hell, even in Voyager... With the, uh, I can't remember the name of the episode. It was earlier this season. The one with Seven and the other drones. It took them a while to master the concept of I. And yet this drone immediately grasps I. Now, I know why the queen is talking out loud. It's so the audience can hear her. That's still stupid. They could have done a voiceover. They could have actually done nothing, for that matter. Imagine the added creepy potential, and I'll be building up to a point here. If the queen didn't say anything, if there was no dialogue in the teaser, it was just her, and she looks at the drone, and, and you know, there would be, like, conveyance of communication there. Because there is communication happening. They're the freaking collective. But we don't hear or see any of it. It's just, hmm. And then he's like, hmm. And then she slowly is walking around him. You wouldn't even have to change the blocking of the scene that much. Just she's walking around him, and he's like, Oh, God, something's wrong. And you know something's happening, but you don't know what. And then, you know, teaser, cut to trailer, and what that and whatnot. Wouldn't that have been more effective? And trust me, that's building up to another point. Seven doesn't disclose the most disturbing part of her dream, which I find a little bit strange. Given that this is Seven of freaking Nine... Or, to be more accurate, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I said her name wrong. Given that this is Seven, there's, that's a point I'll be leading up to as well, this is the kind of person who isn't going to be shy about something that bothered her, especially to one of the only people she's truly comfortable with, the Doctor. And yet she mentions the dream and seeing people, but she doesn't mention how he tried to freaking touch her face. She's not really big on physical intimacy, That'll be a point later, too, by the way. So why doesn't she just tell him about that? If she did, perhaps the doctor could, you know, understand that this is something that actually bothered her, rather than just, it was a dream. At least that's the impression I got. It's possible that it was just supposed to bother her and that wasn't properly conveyed. So, here's a question. One of the things that Voyager has always done well, since the very first episode, is the actors had really good chemistry together. I've said this before and I've said this again, one of the biggest reasons for Voyager's popularity and for the fact that it survived its first couple of seasons was because the actors had amazing chemistry together. There was a lot of natural just flow, oomph, empathy, all of those great things between each of the actors and the main cast. So there's a scene where Tom gets his re-promoted re back to lieutenant. I have so many things wrong with that scene, I don't even know where to begin. First of all, there's no chemistry there. Despite these being those actors. Despite this being a script, a script that was worked on by Joe Minoski, whose biggest thing is, what is it again? Characterization. He's a good character author, they're good together, and they've got good character dynamic. And we've seen this many times before. Why is that scene so awkward? And so, uh, what's the other, I wrote on a uh, bland. 
awkward and bland. Why is there no music playing of any kind? Why is the blocking terrible to the point where they actually had to readjust how some of the actors moved just so that they could move into the screen for a shot? It's, in my blunt opinion, bad directing. And furthermore, why hasn't Harry Kim been promoted? I'm 100% I'm serious here. Harry Kim... Okay, ignoring the fact that Star Trek tends to play it a little loose with promotions, ignore, and, and I mean, for God's sakes, you know, there's... I, I'm not going to go into examples. The point being, there are several times where Star Trek promotes its people a little bit more quickly than a standard military would, but that's okay. Because some people think it's not a military, and some people think it's not a standard military. So that's okay. But then why isn't he promoted? Nog is a higher rank than Kim is right now. As of this episode, Nog is a higher rank than Harry Kim. Now, I know what you're saying. Well, that's a desperate situation. They're in a war with the Dominion. They need as many officers as possible. Yeah, Harry Kim has performed rather exemplary for six years now. Six full years, because this is the end of season six. And yet, in six years, he has not received a field commendation. He has not received a field promotion. He's still an ensign. Now, in the overall body of works, we do know eventually Harry does go on to become captain and hold that seat for some time. And by body of works, I mean STO, because let's be honest, that's the only place Star Trek has continued. Um, but, what? The, the music thing, by the way. What is with the music in this episode? I actually was... I mentioned I was writing down individual notes. One of the individual notes I kept writing down was every scene in which the music was wrong. I decided to stop because it was every scene. I've talked before about the generic music problem in Voyager, and it is a very real problem. But this is above and beyond. This episode... I think the last episode I really saw the bad music problem be over the top in, like this was in the episode Basics. Season 2. So, there's no music during the, the reward ceremony. And then they go and they find a colony that's been wiped out by the Borg. Now that is a scene that writes itself. We have heard a distress signal. We respond as quickly as we can. The asteroid slowly turns. No life signs. Borg weapons. Moment of silence. I mean, that writes itself. And yet there's no impact. No emotion. No tension. There's nothing in that scene. The music is wrong. The acting is wrong. Everything about that scene is absent what it should have. Imagine for a moment how TNG would have handled a scene like that. Later TNG. You know, Mid-TNG, actually, when it was really good. Or Deep Space Nine. There have been scenes that I could think of in TNG and Deep Space Nine where they have seen less large-scale devastation from less horrifying enemies and been impacted by it more. And yet they see this side and it's just like, well, whatever. One other thing that this episode does really badly is the guest stars. I looked up the name of the gentleman who plays Axum and I have forgotten it because he is very immemorable. Now this is weird, because he's played a couple of other roles in Star Trek. He played uh, Idiot Boy McGee over on Star Trek Insurrection. But he also played, at least passably well, in Voyager, in the killing game. He played the psychopathic Herosian, the one who was willing to kill and blah, be a beast and all that stuff. And I never had any problem with his performance there. And yet here, he is bland bordering on tepid. Everything about his performance is absent acting. And that's true for every single guest star in this episode. The woman whose name I've forgotten, the Klingon who doesn't even act Klingon. In fact, if I close my eyes and listen to him, I can't tell he's a Klingon. I have seen fans out of costume act more Klingon than that guy. And then there's the kid. Now again, child actors, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't change the fact that he's... It, there's so much bad acting amongst the guest stars. It's universal. I'm not even going to comment on the no memory of the place thing. That's a conceit I'm at least willing to accept. Why does the queen keep talking out loud? Why does the queen keep talking out loud? <laughs> now, I know, I know. I, I've, already, I've already said this, haven't I? Whoops, did I stop? Okay, I accidentally put my notes on the keyboard there. I've already said this. 
it's so that we can tell what she's saying. And yet she's not saying anything informative. She's acting like a normal crew of Voyager, actually. No, I'm 100% serious. Think about what she says. She's techno-babbling. She's explaining exactly what she's doing and how she's doing it. She then says, oh, this technobabble thing is in the way. Let's use this technobabble to solve it. It is completely standard Voyager stock Voyager dialogue. This would later be used on Enterprise to extend as well. Why is she saying this? Again, silence might have worked better, but okay, fine. You want the audience to be cued in on what she's doing. Sure, I understand that. Voice over. The Queen's voice. Or even the Collective's voice. Or even the Queen's voice talking to the Collective's voice. Because we do know there's a distinction there. In, in, in voiceover. There's no need to have her strut around and say, I am now going to pick up this can that has a, a liquid nourishment that I will now consume. Warning, I have encountered a problem with consuming this liquid. It has been angled at the wrong angle. I will now correct this and try again. Except with more techno babble, I can't do that. Sorry, guys. Why is she? Do that's that is exactly what she's doing. That's not a joke. She's talking to herself. She does this the whole episode. <laughs> then, <laughs> just to show how self-aware this episode is, one of the lines is specifically the proof they need to prove that Seven actually, you know, that this sanctuary Unimatrix Zero actually exists. Now that's a real problem. The odds of it being just a dream of hers are actually pretty high. And the odds of it being some kind of hidden nexus sanctuary that's existed for years amongst the, the, the collective, undetected, for years, is actually pretty low. But it's okay. They have cast iron proof. They, she never entered, entered REM sleep. Now, I know some of you may not know this. Actually, probably all of you know this because you're smarter than whoever worked on this friggin' episode, but REM stands for Rapid Eye Movement. Twice in this episode, with the random Borg drone, and with Seven, they bother to go out of their way to zoom right in on the eye and show Rapid Eye Movement. This is when I mentioned that this is when my note happens where I mentioned the script feels like a first draft. But I noticed something else. This is what I... I haven't used this term a lot because I haven't encountered this a lot. But this feels like a Control-F script. For those of you who don't know what that means, if you're in like a Word document, hit, hit Control-F, it's a find, and you can do find and replace. And that is in many ways how this script feels. It felt like they took an existing script, butchered it, and then didn't go back and repolish it. So it's actually kind of worse than just a first draft. It's a first draft that was then crudely edited and then never you know, polished or edited or doctored up after that. Why... Why does Seven suddenly just act completely differently in the Sanctuary? I mean, her appearance... Okay, sure, she can choose whatever. No surprise that Janeway is in uniform. Of course she would be. That would, That's not something I'm going to complain about. But J Seven not only appears completely differently, acts completely differently, but she also calls herself Annika. There's actually a pretty crucial scene. It's, it's the only thing. I mentioned right here. It's the only positive thing in this episode. And I don't think it was intentional. It's a scene where Janeway mentions how she's... You know, she thinks that the name suits Seven. She thinks that Annika suits Seven. And she thinks her more human persona... Suits 7. This is kind of a rehash, admittedly, but still a continuing thread of a common part of Seven's character development, and to be blunt, of Janeway's character development as well. The fact that Janeway wants Seven to be more human. Not to be Seven. Not to be herself. You know, I've talked about this so many times. Seven is not human, and she is not Borg. She is the Spock equivalent. She is both. And she should be accepted and embraced in that, in my opinion. But Janeway insists on trying to pull her towards the human side, and the Queen always insists on trying to pull her towards the Borg side. This has been a continuing thread. So I like that repetition of the continuation there, but I still feel like it was unintentional. Like, we're supposed to believe this moving towards more human thing is actually a good thing. 
instead of another form of assimilation. <sighs> you know, I have a note here that says, of course Janeway would want a civil war in the Borg. And it's Janeway, after all. But, let's be honest. Just about any Starfleet captain, if they had the opportunity to assist in a civil war in the Borg, would probably jump at the chance. I mean, I know, Prime Directive, you know, all that fun stuff, blah, 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 blah. But this is the Borg we're talking about. There are certain things that bypass the standard rules. And Starfleet themselves, who are very much sticklers about rules and regulations, nevertheless tend to acknowledge that when it comes to things like the Borg. So that doesn't bother me. Here's what bothers me. The episode goes out of its way to establish that one in about a million drones has the random defect that makes them capable of accessing the Sanctuary, Unimatrix Zero. Actually, one little side note, really quick before I go on. I actually kind of like that. The idea that there's some random mathematical flux amongst the drones that happens to equate to other random mathematical fluxes actually makes a lot of sense. When you consider the trillions upon trillions of drones there are, mathematically speaking, you're going to have these kind of mutant aberrations in there. So I, I kind of like that. But anyways, so I guess that's two things I like in the episode. But that's still one in a million drones having access to this place. So what chance does she think this revolution is going to have? One drone... In a million. Which, forgive me for flaunting my incredible mathematical skills here, but that means the odds against them are roughly a million to one. <laughs> I s okay, fine. They're 999,999 to one. There, let's, let's be more accurate. Is that better? <laughs> That's ridiculous. The Rebellion in Star Wars faced better odds than that. The Rebellion, by most figures, faced uh, about a dozen to one odds against them, against the Empire. And they lost constantly, as well they should, because those are ridiculous odds. Now imagine the Empire outnumbered them a million to one. All right, let's fight against the Death Star. And then a hundred thousand Star Destroyers warp in over Yavin, and the Rebellion is crushed. The end. When you get into the millions, mathematically speaking, you're just screwed. Now, uh, 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 hang on, a bit of my soul just died as I just reread this part. I had to remember the scene. Janeway, <laughs> God, there's a scene in this episode where Janeway, inside of a dream that doesn't actually exist, picks up Batleth, and uses it to successfully fight a drone in hand-to-hand -hand combat. I don't even know what else to say about that. Now, you remember how I've been talking about the Queen talking this whole time? Yeah, I know, I've been talking about talking. She, and I've been talking about how it's stupid. If I was handed this script, I would make at least one, I'd make 50 changes, but there's one change that occurred to me immediately that would actually, in my opinion, add to the episode. I mentioned not having the Queen talk at all in her first scene. I mentioned maybe having a voiceover in her second scene. But this scene, where she finds them and she starts identifying them and sending the drones in, no dialogue, no voiceover, just her, you know, the, the, the screen pops up and you see a cube and a little on the on the scanner, and then another drone pops in and starts going after someone. No need for her to talk. I mean, why is she talking out loud to a drone standing right next to her to give him orders? No dialogue, right? And, you know, just the danger music and the drones are slowly winning. And then Janeway fights off one of the drones and cuts it off. And then we cut to the Borg Queen who watches on her view screen. Why is she watching things on a view screen? And, you know, we see Janeway. And then for the first time in the episode, she speaks aloud one word. Janeway. Wouldn't that have worked better than have her rambling about technobabble and bullcrap up to this point? To have her first line of spoken dialogue be the word Janeway? Think about that for a moment. So, here's a question for you. Why does a Starfleet captain have to convince a leader of a resistance rebellion army to re in help people incite a rebellion against their oppressive masters? Why? I'll tell you why, because it was in Scorpion. 
No, I'm serious. It's actually mentioned that they were trying to do callbacks to Scorpion and Best of Both Worlds throughout this episode. But again, why? Hey, Chakotay, do you want to help these people? Yeah, all right. Seen on. I wrote a line here that just says, lots of explain every damned thing dialogue. The episode is rife with it. I mean, I made fun of the Queen for it, but everyone does it in this episode. I like to call this treating the audience like they're stupid. This came up for me, well, a bit ago, when I was doing my rumination on The Hunt for Red October. One of the things I praised about that movie was they didn't have treat you like you're an idiot dialogue. What I mean by this, and I'm only going to cover this briefly because I've talked about this topic many times, is it really irks me. When a, when a fictional work bothers to put in dialogue explaining every tiny little detail as if the audience is stupid. Because what that does is it treats the audience as if it's stupid. It just basically says to you, you're an idiot, so I'm going to hold your hand so you understand every tiny little thing that's happening. Rather than allowing us to infer what's happening, treat us like we're intelligent, show things that are happening, have things that logically progress because of what just happened, you know, there's a great scene in Hunt for Red October, I forget the exact scene, so forgive me for misquoting it, where they're like, alright, we got this news, and he gets the newspaper and he looks at it, we never, he doesn't say anything, and we don't see what's on it, he just gets this slowly worried look, and the next scene is him going into the office to meet with the high, the high command. That's a great scene. And immediately, we understand. We're smart enough to put two and two together. If this ep if, if the writing of this episode was in that, he would say, I am now reading this letter, Oh my goodness, this is saying that this horrible thing is happening. And then it would cut to the next scene, and then they would explain it again. And the second time they would explain, Oh, wow, this horrible thing is happening. Well, what's this horrible thing mean? Well, this horrible thing that has horribly happened means this horrible outcome. They would explain what's happening, why it's happening, and what the outcome is of it. And they do that constantly, and it drives me freaking crazy. Also, tactical cubes. <laughs> We've kind of heard of the concept of tactical cubes before, and tactical cubes are... Well, I, I mean, I, we don't have a lot of information to draw on, but the general idea is a Borg cube is certainly kind of an all-purpose utility tool. It's kind of the, the galaxy class of the Borg. You know, it's, it's a cruiser. It's intended to do all sorts of things. A tactical cube is designed to destroy things, <laughs> to, to just win engagements. And we're going to go after a tactical cube in an Intrepid. Sure. Well, why don't we just wait for another Borg? Oh no, no, there's no other ships in the region. Why? <laughs> Why is the only ship... In fact, this actually brings up another question. Why is the only Borg cube around here one that they only send to offensive missions? What is the Borg fighting around here that deserves a tactical cube to be present? Ah, but no, that would require thought. I'm sorry, forgive me. So, there's a seat. <laughs> oh my god, there's... Then the next scene. The next scene is like the worst scene in the entire episode. That's a lie. The second worst scene in the entire episode. Um, so it starts with Axiom trying... Did I say Axiom? Axum trying to convince Seven that this is not your fight and you don't need to help us. And blah, 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 blah. And then shortly thereafter... L I mean, <laughs> hang on. I, I really got to dissect this. So... <laughs> oh, hang on. It's actually hurting my brain trying to think about this. So the next scene, let's just let's just talk about it bluntly without analysis. First, we're losing and trying to convince Seven and, and, and Voyager that this is not their fight. And then you hide from some Borg, and then Seven kisses Axum, and then angst. This is the scene. Why is Axum, who was desperate for their help and desperate to try and convince them to help, suddenly flipping his stance on that with no reason or motivation, and then immediately gives up on the idea? Why is the music during the scene in which Axum is doing this and they're receiving information that they're losing on all fronts trying to be inspiring? Why do they then have about 40 seconds of them hiding from drones who for some reason can't see them through leaves? And, the, and nothing happens. That's just what happens. Of course, I actually do know the answer to that one because that immediately leads into him having his arm around her. Which brings me to my next question. Why does Seven kiss Axum? Now, I could have seen that scene work. I could. I could see how it could be constructed. It would, it would be several shadings different. The idea... Imagine, so what happens is she leans in and there's this big, romantic, passionate kind of moment. And then it's like, oh my god, we were something closer. Then angst 
is immediately what follows. No, we must never be together, blah, blah, blah. And you all know where that's going. And by the way, just to spoil it for the next episode, that is absolutely where it's going, if you haven't seen part two. You could have sh structured it differently. Have her be cold and mechanical in the kiss of him. And then say something, rather than, you know, we were more than friends or some ridiculous dialogue. Have her say something along the lines of, that felt familiar too. Thus indicating, without explaining, that Seven recognizes that that is an action she has taken before. Because she's always she's had these vague memory recollections of this place this whole time, right? So now she has specifically interacted with something in a way to provoke a memory, and then she uses that to put the puzzle piece together. And have him be like, oh, she's kissing me. Yes, she's back. And then have him you know, portray hurt and, and betrayal as he realizes she was doing it just as an experiment. That would have been a little bit of a different shading on that scene and might have made that work. But instead it's like, oh. Also, I'm just going to read my note here. A kiss initiated by Seven. Then there's a scene <laughs> that i got to laugh at. There's the scene where the queen... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The queen takes over Voyager's view screen. She doesn't hail them. She just takes over part of the part of Voyager from God knows how far away. Now, let me just go ahead and say, of everything I'm about to say, that's the one thing that doesn't bother me. The Borg should be able to do that. If some random energy thing accidentally can take control of Voyager, I'm pretty sure the Borg could do it deliberately, even from a distance. But moving on. She takes over, talks to Janeway, and tries diplomacy with her. Okay. Why? Now, it's actually a decent scene. It's probably one of the few well-constructed scenes in, in terms of just the directing and the acting in the entire episode. But the construction of it, the lead-up to it, the writing around it is still nonsensical. If she can take over this, why not do so f more further? Well, maybe she's more limited. Okay, she knows exactly where Voyager is now. Why not just send ships after them? Well, Voyager might evade them. How? The Borg are faster and more maneuverable and have better sensors. Okay. Um, why does she try diplomacy at all? Let's assume for a moment she could infiltrate more of Voyager's sh systems and just take in the information from their databanks to determine exactly what's going on and what they're after. Also, why does she care? No, I'm serious. Why does she give a damn? This is something that will crop up in part two, by the way. I know just from memory. I haven't watched part two again yet. But just from memory, the Borg Queen takes way too much of an interest in the crew. And then there's one thing. Well, actually, let me diverge for just a second. One of the things that several of my viewers tend to hate in fiction, and they've actually disagreed with me on several points on this one, is the idea of treating the player character like they're special. You know, saying, you are, you are the chosen one or the destined one or whatever. And I admit, I get tired of the whole prophecy of destiny thing. But what I do enjoy is earning it. I enjoy working my point, my way up to the point where I can be considered the man, where I'm considered the main character, where I'm considered a mover of continents or a mover of worlds. When you build up to that kind of reputation, it makes sense for someone to treat you as if you are very, very dangerous. That is the whole premise behind the basically run speech in Doctor Who, when, uh... Oh god, I can't think of his name all of a sudden. The guy after Tennant, I can't think of his name, uh, became the Doctor. Because it was all because he had earned that reputation. He wasn't just randomly, I am the main character because I am the main character because of ancient prophecy. He'd done a lot of things to build up to that, right? But in my opinion, Voyager has not actually earned that reputation from the Borg. Certainly they have interacted with the Borg several times, and they have survived the Borg. But that's about it. The most they've ever done is mildly slow down the Borg. For the Borg to treat them like a real threat, like this scene kind of makes it happen, it just feels like it's thrown in to make Voyager seem more badass than they actually are. Oh, and then, so now that I've finished my voice segue, let me talk about the part of the scene that really bothers me. She turns to Harry and says, We'll see you soon, Harry. Now, I've been asked more than once, by more than a few people, in real life, and on the show, I've actually had people ask me about this in advance, what the hell does that mean? The Harry Kim Borg subplot was something that was part of the original script and was going to be f fleshed out in part two. 
I'll go ahead and tell you right now, no further hint of that is ever mentioned. At least, I, I'm saying that by memory. When I go back through episode two, I will make it a point to really pay attention and see if they ever bring it up, even once. Again, I don't think they will, though. So, that is exactly what happens when you do a first draft, no polishing, control F rewrite of a script, and then just kind of leave subplots in there without taking them out. It goes nowhere, is what I'm trying to say. This is not new to Star Trek. TNG actually did that a couple of times, too. A few instances I can think of right off the top of my head. <sighs> and then the very next scene, I have a note written down. It's one word. The word is, and I'm going to try and say this out loud how I wrote it. <clears throat> Angst. It's dumb. It's dumb. It's like teenagers. Angsting. It's dumb. Moving on. Why is the queen talking to herself when the battle happens at the end of the episode? Why is the queen running the battle personally? Why is the queen giving orders out loud to her ships? And then the worst of all. Actually, before we get to that, really quick. Why doesn't the cube pursue them after Voyager flees? It should have. It could have. They're faster, they're more maneuverable, and that's a freaking tactical cube. It would have beat the crap out of Voyager. Grab, sh yoink. But no, they let him go for some reason. Why? 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 Do they take what could have been the only good scene in this entire episode and utterly ruin it? The construction of the scene is such that we are supposed to believe that they've got some clever plan on board the cube. And they're all tense. They're all worried, and they're not really sure what to do, they're not really sure how it's going to go, and they're slowly making their way, and they're going to sneak their way in and, and beam on board the cube and do something. We don't know details. They specifically go out of their way to avoid giving us details, and yet, then we cut to the doctor twice, I think, who's like, oh, life's unstable. And then there's the point at which they get assimilated, and the first thing we hear is, and I wrote it down word for word, so far so good. That one line destroys the finale of this episode. Utterly ruins it. Big, tense build-up. Oh, God, things have gone wrong. Oh, no, this is part of the plan. Why even hide the details of the plan from the audience if you're going to give it away so blatantly? Why deflate any sense of tension or loss? Or, you know, oh, God, it's gotten dark. Now we're going to have to recover from this horrible loss. Why destroy all of that with that one terrible line. Granted, the cuts to the doctor also gave it away as well, but that line just put it up there on a big neon signs. Don't worry, this is intentional. I actually feel, it's not a joke, I actually feel like someone involved in the writing staff, <clears throat> excuse me, actually said, well, hang on. We don't want them to think that Voyager's losing. We better do something about that. And they threw that line in just to make sure the audience knew it's okay. Things will work out. I hate this episode. I'll see you next week for part two.